gave her everything I could and all the love that I could ever give. I did, I heard a, a faint scream and a splash. All I could think of is he loved her so much. Why would he? Why? Maybe it was my daughter. Is she okay? I don't know, John. Then he walked to the side of the bridge and he threw the child into the water. We've all heard the defense that a perpetrator was insane at the time they committed a horrific crime. They didn't know right from wrong. I don't know about you, but I am tired of hearing mental health being used as an excuse for doing horrible things to other people and especially children. So many people out there suffer from mental illness, and when people use it as excuses like they did in today's case, it's honestly insulting. When researching this case, one question came up a lot. Was he evil or insane? And after hearing the details of this case, I want each and every one of you to answer that question in the comments below, because whether you agree with me or not, it's a discussion that needs to be had. Now, when it comes to researching these cases, the biggest struggle for me sometimes can be staying focused. With so many distractions like wanting to check my phone, text friends back all the time, it can be really hard to keep my attention on what really matters. And that's why I'm so thankful that Magic Mind reached out to me and sent me some of their products to try out. Magic Mind is a mental performance shot that helps you think better and faster while helping to reduce overall stress. They give you 100% of your daily vitamin C and D per bottle, which helps me stay more focused, mentally clear, and more productive throughout the day. Now, Magic Mind works best over the course of multiple days. It is not a quick fix but it's so easy to integrate into your everyday routine. Now, I try taking a Magic Mind shot every day for the course of seven days, and by now, I feel like I can definitely get through my day more focused without that exhausting caffeine crash that normally happens to me every single day. I have so much going on in my life right now, taking me so many different directions. It's so important that I can stay focused and I feel like Magic Mind has really helped my productivity skyrocket. It's not caffeine, which simply blocks your neuroreceptors that make you tired, leading to a caffeine crash one to three hours later. Instead, it has up to 12 active ingredients that help support your body's energy engine, ATP, day after day. It's not a fleeting charge up. It's an enhancement for every day. So if you wanna keep your mind clear and stay focused, give Magic Mind a try out for yourself. For the next 10 days, you can get up to 48% off your first subscription when you head to magicmind.com slash Rachel Shannon and use code RS20. Once again, that's magicmind.com slash Rachel Shannon using code RS20 for up to 48% off your first subscription at Magic Mind. Now, with all of that being said, let's get into today's case. Today, we are going to be discussing the horrific case of Phoebe Johnchuk. Phoebe Johnchuk was born to parents Michelle Kerr and John Johnchuk on August 22nd, 2009. Before we talk about Phoebe and who she was as a person, I wanna talk more about her parents and what they were like. John Johnchuk had a rough life from the start. He was born to an alcoholic father who ended up being arrested for beating his mother. His mother worked a low paying job, so she was already struggling to make ends meet before she was fired for stealing from her job and was found to be in possession of cocaine. She too left John when he was just five years old. So there was little John with both parents abandoning him and leaving him alone in this world. He ended up being taken in by uncles Brian and Tim for some time. While there, John started showing some extreme behavioral problems. He would lash out at Brian and Tim, causing physical harm and destroying their property. But then, by the age of 12, John's father, John Sr., showed back up and decided to take him back. There, John Jr. lived with his dad and stepmom in a duplex in Tampa, Florida. It was said that once back with his father, life just continued to get harder for John, with John Sr. physically abusing him, and the conditions of the home where they lived were less than ideal. Now, these statements have been disputed by John Sr., who said that he never physically abused his son, but of course, John Jr. is the one that is claiming that these things happened. So we truly don't know, but I feel like there is a little bit of truth in what both of them are saying. John Jr. could be exaggerating, and obviously, I don't think John Sr. would ever take accountability for abusing a child. 
both can be true at the same time. When John Jr. was in middle school, he was described as being fun, outgoing, and loud. He was intelligent and made friends easily. He told those around him that he was gay, and even though some kids picked on him for it, it never seemed to bother him. From there, John Jr. went on to high school, but he actually ended up dropping out and was committed to a hospital after showing some severe mental health issues. Upon his release, he took online classes and earned his GED. By the age of 17, he started experimenting with drugs such as synthetic marijuana and meth. He also worked at a strip club as he grew into adulthood, which allowed him to experiment sexually while also continuing his drug habit. By the age of 18, John met then 23-year-old Michelle Kerr. From the first time he saw her, he was drawn in by her beauty. The two met through friends and immediately connected. They would do their makeup together, went dancing at gay bars, and jammed out to music together. The two got along so well, partially because Michelle had a similar backstory. Michelle was born to parents who had issues of their own. Her dad left the family when she was in kindergarten. She was then raised by her mother until she was 16, at which time her mother ended up taking her own life. At the time of her meeting John, Michelle had two children, a son and a daughter. Her daughter had actually been taken away from her and was living with relatives. Her son was still with her. However, she had previously been charged with neglecting her son when he was five years old. In that situation, I guess he was supposed to be picked up from the bus stop by a babysitter, but the babysitter never came. He was left there alone, so Michelle was charged with neglect. This wasn't enough for him to be taken away though, so he stayed with her for the years that followed. So at this point, it's Michelle and John, two best friends who have bonded over their similar histories. However, there was one night where John told Michelle that he may actually not be gay, and he realized that he was in love with her. From there, the two actually started a relationship. After starting this new romance, John quickly moved in with Michelle. The two enrolled in classes at the Hillsborough Community College together, where she worked towards becoming a graphic artist and John worked towards becoming a paralegal. The two seemed to be doing well, progressing in their relationship and falling harder and harder for one another. However, as their relationship continued, Michelle started to become concerned with John's controlling and jealous attitude. He would become upset if she spent too much time away from the home. He would freak out over the smallest things, flying off the handle at the drop of a hat. She started to wonder if she could even stay in this relationship. But soon after this started, she actually found herself pregnant again. This time, she was pregnant with a baby girl who was born August 22nd, 2009. This baby was little Phoebe, who was named after John's childhood chihuahua. Phoebe was a beautiful baby girl with curly hair and big green eyes. She was a calm baby who rarely cried and slept well throughout the night. As she grew into a toddler, her daycare teachers described her as very shy and introverted, but overall, a happy child. She loved apple juice and Cheerios, sparkly pink, and books about dogs. She just had the biggest smile that could attract attention from just about anyone. It was said that after Phoebe's birth, despite all the issues in his past, John really stepped up to be a good father. He rocked her to sleep fed her, changed her diapers. He loved his little baby and wanted everyone to see just how amazing his daughter was. After Michelle's maternity leave was over, she was going to return to work while John was going to stay home with the baby. However, it was around this time when Michelle was actually starting to experience muscle weakness, spasms, and difficulty walking. She ended up being diagnosed with multiple sclerosis, or MS. She stopped working and started receiving disability payments while John started jumping from job to job to help make ends meet. For the months and years that followed, things seemed to be going well until they started progressively going downhill. By the time Phoebe was around 10 months old, authorities were called to the apartment where John, Michelle, and Phoebe lived, responding to reports of domestic violence. In this report, John apparently shoved Michelle onto the floor and began punching her. As a result, John had to complete a court-ordered domestic violence program. After finishing that, Michelle dropped the charges. By 2012, once again, authorities were called this time by neighbors who reported that they saw John choking Michelle. By the time law enforcement arrived, two-year-old little Phoebe had locked herself in her parents' room to hide from them, but John had kicked the door down to get her out. 
DCFS also got involved in this case and determined that Phoebe was at high risk of harm. However, John and Michelle agreed to go to counseling, so DCFS dismissed the case. During this time, John's mother actually decided to get clean and come back into his life and be there for little Phoebe. This was overall a good thing, but of course, John still had his resentment. He was hurt that his own mother didn't even raise him, yet she wanted back in his life to help him raise her grandchild, living with the family for a short period. During this time, John was known to often fly into a rage at his mother, often getting physical with her and especially Michelle. There was one time where John apparently poured hot coffee on Michelle, shoved her to the ground, and even punched her in the face. There was one time where John dragged his own mother down the stairs and tried throwing a concrete block at her. All things that are incredibly disturbing and violent and obviously very unhealthy and traumatic for a child to see. Yet, throughout most of these times, neither of them would call the authorities because they didn't want to shake things up even more. Also during this time, John's mother reports that he started saying some really weird, demonic things, always accusing Michelle and his mother of being the devil. He said that he saw bad spirits all around. As I mentioned earlier, John had gotten into meth when he was younger, so it's believed that around this time, he started smoking meth again, which was causing him to become paranoid and delusional. By January of 2013, after several incidents of John acting out and becoming violent, Michelle did go to the courts to file for a domestic violence injunction against John, but this was actually denied. Then, there was one incident where Michelle was in the backyard with Phoebe. John came out and shoved her into the sand and then punched her three times in the face. She got away and ran inside, but he then chased her into the bathroom and smashed her head against the bathtub. Finally, after this incident, police were called and John was arrested. But once again, shortly after being arrested, Michelle dropped the charges. After this, though, she did move out of the home and decided to officially be done with her relationship with John. Once out of jail, John actually took to the courts to report that Michelle was the violent one. He told the judge that Michelle pulled a box cutter out on him and was able to get at him with it. At this time, John did appear to have cuts on his arm. However, they appeared to be self-inflicted. Now, Michelle actually hadn't been notified about this hearing, and even if she had, she couldn't afford a lawyer. So either way, she didn't end up showing up, so there was no one there to contest the injunction. So despite the past history of domestic violence accusations against John, despite the whole box cutter thing appearing to be false and appearing to be self-inflicted, the domestic violence injunction against Michelle was actually granted. As a result, John got to keep Phoebe in his care. He wasn't actually officially granted custody, but as a result of the domestic violence injunction, Michelle was no longer allowed to see her. As I mentioned earlier, Michelle had been getting disability benefits, so John was also granted Phoebe's share of those benefits. This injunction lasted for the year that followed, until June of 2014. For that entire year, Michelle never got to see her daughter. As I mentioned earlier as well, Michelle was also dealing with her MS symptoms, so as much as she wanted to fight for her daughter, she was also dealing with a lot with her own health, which made it really difficult to continue fighting with John. One of the biggest symptoms of MS is just fatigue, so when you're exhausted all the time, you're in pain from your disease, it makes things a lot more difficult. For the year that John had sole custody of Phoebe, the two moved around from place to place. In total, I believe they moved around eight different times with eight different family members and friends. John had also dated a series of different women, I believe five in total that year, all who would ultimately allow John and Phoebe to move in with them. According to these women, it wasn't their relationships with John that made them okay with these living arrangements, it was his daughter. None of these women could bear seeing a child go without a home. So, 
they welcomed them into their homes. But once he would get into these women's homes and sink his teeth into them, he clung on like a leech and he showed them an absolute lack of respect. He continued his habit of smoking meth, scaring the ever-loving crap out of these women when he went on these demonic tirades of ranting about the devil and then getting into fights with everyone around him. He would also make a mess and destroy every room he was given to live in. Every time he was kicked out of a place or a relationship ended, he would leave the room in horrific condition with dirty clothes and trash everywhere. And once, he even broke the bed before he moved out of one of his girlfriend's places. He was an entitled little freak. Then, after each time he was asked to move out of a girlfriend's or a friend's place, he would try to call the cops on them as a way to get them in trouble as revenge, I guess. During this time, from June of 2013 to July of 2014, Don would be arrested for domestic violence a couple more times. A few of these women that he dated tried taking out domestic violence injunctions against John, but they were usually denied. John tried taking one out against one of the women as well, but he too was denied. At one point, John ended up staying with a friend while Phoebe stayed with John's two uncles that we heard about earlier, Brian and Tim. In her short time there, Phoebe flourished. She loved living with them, and they loved having her. They watched as John's behaviors grew more and more unstable and out of control, and they worried about little Phoebe's safety. They were actually ready to adopt her right before John came back and snatched her out of their care. But finally, by the fall of 2014, Phoebe moved in with John's mother while John continued living with friends. This period was described as probably the most stable period in little Phoebe's life. Either she or John would drop her off at kindergarten every day. According to Phoebe's teachers, she was always happy, clean, and healthy. Phoebe made friends in kindergarten despite her shy, introverted nature. She had big dreams of either becoming a dancer or a doctor. She appeared to have a very healthy attachment to her father, always being upset when he had to leave her after dropping her off at school. No one ever saw anything concerning. She never showed signs of neglect or abuse. She never even missed a day of school. She had perfect attendance. She was just a happy but shy little girl. But by late 2014, things in John's life started to grow more and more out of his control. Finally, by Thanksgiving of that year, John let Michelle see her daughter. They all went to Denny's for dinner, where John also met Michelle's new boyfriend, who she was now living with. After this initial visit with Michelle, Phoebe started asking her dad to see her mom more, and Michelle started pushing harder and harder to have Phoebe in her life. Of course, this just started pissing John off, who couldn't bear the thought of sharing his daughter with anyone else, not even her own mother. Around this time, he had also just lost two jobs he recently started. He started texting friends, lashing out at them, and saying some really hurtful things pretty much out of nowhere. By Christmas of 2014, Phoebe once again was begging to see her mom, which John did allow. John, his mother, and Phoebe all went to Michelle's home for Christmas, joining her and her new boyfriend. That Christmas went about as expected, with Phoebe getting all sorts of presents from everyone and John being resentful and selfish that his mother was giving Phoebe a lot of attention and upset that Michelle was enjoying her time with Phoebe. By the end of the year and into the start of the new year, John returned to his old ways of being nasty and mean towards Michelle. He started calling her a trashy whore, a slut, and other horrible names. He then threatened to file for full custody of Phoebe. Around that time, Michelle had called DCFS to report that John didn't have a stable address, but DCFS never followed up on this. Then, John called DCFS to report that Michelle was insane and on drugs. DCFS did follow up on this, and Michelle passed her drug screen. Then, he filed for yet another domestic violence injunction against Michelle. Again, by this time, the original one he was granted had run out, so he wanted a new one. This time, though, he said that Michelle's new boyfriend is dangerous and that there's weapons all around the home. This time, though, the injunction was denied. During the first week of January, friends and family members of John's were all surprised when they started receiving messages from John, who was asking them all for forgiveness. 
He told friends that he was sorry for mean things he had said in his past, saying he was an addict back then. He asked his uncles not to give up on him, asking that they still believe he can be a good person. But these messages to friends and family members were met with silence. People were past the point of tired when it came to John. Everyone around him saw just how abusive he was towards everybody in his life. He took advantage of people. He was dangerous. This was not a man that deserved forgiveness from anyone in his life. Also around this time, starting around Christmas time, John started to become obsessed with the Bible and religion. He started carrying around this old Swedish Bible, reading it whenever he could, and spreading the word of God. He started telling his mother that he and Phoebe were demons, and he started sprinkling salt all around the doorways of the home to keep the evil spirits out. When he was at work, he quoted Bible verses and spoke of Abraham and Isaac sacrificing a lamb. Those around him felt that he was either in the middle of a mental break or he was ramping up his drug use. By January 7th, John actually had a meeting with his lawyer regarding custody arrangements of Phoebe. But during that meeting, John was acting very strange. He was waving his hands around, talking about this old Bible, which he pulled out and showed his lawyer. He rambled on about wanting to be baptized, saying that he had an appointment with a priest in about an hour. As his lawyer tried talking more about the case at hand, John started to become angry. So eventually, she got him out of her office, fearing for her own safety as John became increasingly agitated. After he left, the lawyer called law enforcement, informing them of his erotic behaviors. Again, he said that she was God and left saying that he needed to be baptized. He mentioned that nothing is going to matter tomorrow, which of course made her wonder what he meant. Was he going to harm himself or Phoebe? Was he going to try and flee the country with Phoebe? What was this all about? She informed police of his plans to go to a church with Phoebe to be baptized, hoping they could intercept him along the way. After leaving the lawyer's office by around 11 a.m., he went to a few different churches, all asking to be baptized or asking them to perform exorcisms on him or Phoebe. The priest said that being baptized was a process and gave him some forms that could help him get the process started. Once leaving the last church he visited, when he walked out, he was met with officers who were waiting for him. This officer spoke with the priest who said that John didn't appear to be a danger to himself or anyone else. He said that John was acting paranoid like people were out to get him, but otherwise he didn't say anything else concerning to him, again, other than wanting to be baptized, but obviously a priest isn't gonna think that that's very concerning. When they spoke with John himself, he said that he was just having a new clarity on life. He was out and looking for guidance, some answers to his questions. He told officers that he hadn't been diagnosed with any mental illness, and he said that he did not think that his lawyer was God, though God was speaking with him. They also spoke with Phoebe, who appeared happy and content. She wasn't afraid of her dad. She was holding his hand, happy to be there. Based on all of this, officers determined that John didn't appear drunk or on drugs. He didn't appear to be in a state of mental break or anything like that. They let him go without any further concern. After letting John and Phoebe go, John continued going to various churches to try and get someone to baptize him, but he was just being told the same thing, that it was a process and they couldn't just do it that day. By 2 p.m., a few hours after being released by those officers, John actually started calling his lawyer again, this time saying that he didn't think Phoebe was really his daughter. This prompted the lawyer to now call DCFS, saying as how the police weren't going to do anything to help. She repeated everything to DCFS that she originally told police and added that now John was acting delusional and saying that Phoebe wasn't his child. By that point, John had called this lawyer again for a third time, saying that he was fine, that he was now home with his dad and stepmom, which was information the lawyer relayed to DCFS. At that time, DCFS told her that since they had an extra eyes on Phoebe from the other adults, i.e. John Sr. and his wife, that they didn't meet the criteria for an agent to go and check on Phoebe. Once again, this lawyer's concerns were not being taken seriously. Later that evening, things quieted down. 
John was now with his dad and stepmom at their house. John's mother also stopped by and they all had dinner together. They then went to the couch and watched some cartoons before everyone fell asleep together. By around 8 p.m., John's mom got up, offering for Phoebe to come back with her so that she could get ready for school the following day with her. But Phoebe wanted to stay with her dad, John, who promised to take her to school the next day. So, not wanting to make him upset, she left, went home, and went to bed, pretty content knowing that John would follow through on his word, especially with his father and stepmom there. However, by the following day, Monday, January 8th, 2014, Phoebe's kindergarten teachers noticed that she wasn't at school. This was pretty unusual because, as I said earlier, she never missed a day. They wondered if she was sick and hoped that she was okay, but she wasn't okay. She wasn't sick and she would never be coming back to school. Turns out, by around 9.30 p.m. that night, John had been up and texting his old friend, Naomi, saying that they belong together, sending her scripture and talking about sea salt. This was a woman with whom he had lived a while back, but he had never shown interest in her like this before. This seemed totally out of the blue. Then he asked her how many people had jumped off the Skyway Bridge, and this really freaked her out. She actually didn't answer any of his text messages. But then by around 10 p.m. that night, Naomi heard the sounds of relentless pounding on her door at her apartment in Tampa. She saw that it was John at her door, so she went into her bedroom to hide. She felt that John may have been there to hurt her and her son. She was terrified. The next thing we know, a neighbor reports seeing John holding his little girl's hand, pacing back and forth around the parking lot at Naomi's apartment complex. The neighbor was concerned because the little girl wasn't wearing a coat or shoes and appeared to be really cold on this January night but this neighbor wasn't concerned enough to call the authorities. By around 12 a.m., now going into January 9th, a cop saw a white PT cruiser speeding down the interstate going over 100 miles an hour. From Tampa, John was now driving towards St. Petersburg. On the highway, the officer saw the car suddenly slam on their brakes, causing smoke to come up from the tires. The cop started tailing this car without turning on the lights and sirens, but he did call in the plates. As he followed, he saw the car suddenly slow before veering to the right on Dick Meisner Bridge and stopping on the shoulder. The officer watched as the man got out of his car, looking disheveled, still wearing his pajamas while carrying a large book. The man started walking towards the officer, shouting things at him such as, you have no free will, as the cop yelled back at him to get back in his car. The man then walked around to the rear passenger side of the car and grabbed a child out of the back seat. He held her with her face pressed into his shoulder as he walked towards the guardrail. It appeared at that time that the child was asleep, but then she started waking up. As the cop raised his gun to the man, he then lifted the girl and threw her over the guardrail, 62 feet above the water. The cop heard a sudden scream before hearing a splash down below. The man didn't look down to see what he had just done. He just threw the girl, turned around, and walked back to his car. This caused immediate panic in the officer who called for backup, screaming that a man just threw his kid into the water. The officer raced down under the bridge to find this little girl, but he couldn't see anything. There was a heavy wind that night, so other officers said that the girl was probably heading towards the west already, but the officer went down that ladder on the bridge anyways. As that happened, other officers started showing up at the scene, shining their lights down at the water. Everyone panicked trying to recover this child. I was immediately concerned for the child. Uh, I advised radio of what had happened. Um, I was shocked, but immediately my concern is to try the health, welfare, and safety of the child. Did you hear anything when the child was dropped from the top of the bridge? I did. I heard a, a faint scream and a splash. What happened to the defendant, the driver of the vehicle? Uh, the driver returned to his vehicle, crossed between our two vehicles, and left. And what did you do? Uh, immediately ran to the edge of the bridge uh, looking for any sign of, of life, uh, some, something in the water. Uh, I didn't see anything at all at that point. Uh, it was very cold and windy that night. Um, my options were limited. I did notice that there was a uh, service ladder to the left of me, which would have been the south. 
uh, immediately climbed down the service ladder, uh, calling the entire way down, and worked my way down to a uh, like a safety bumper area for the supports for the bridge where I continued to call and try and look for the girl. Winds were gusting over 20 miles an hour. At a couple of points, I was nearly blown off of the, uh, the bumper walkway area at the bottom of the bridge. By this point, the man had managed to get back into his car and drive off away from the bridge and over to the next county. A bunch of cop cars followed him, pursuing him in a high-speed chase. Once on the interstate, he made a U-turn and ended up driving on the wrong way on the highway, almost hitting one of the officers head on. At this point, there were now helicopters in the sky and more than a dozen officers from surrounding counties all joining in on the chase. Finally, about 15 minutes after the chase started on Interstate 75, after blowing a tire, the man stopped his car, but he wouldn't get out. The officer started surrounding him, demanding him to get out of the car, but he wouldn't move. So, one of the officers came up to his car, smashed the window with his baton, and yanked this man out. Of course, as you could have guessed by now, the man was John, and the little girl he just threw over the rail was five-year-old little Phoebe. As that was happening, officers had called in the National Guard to aid in the search for Phoebe. They had volunteers from the local community college come in to help, as well as more officers, all who were desperate to find the child. As I said, this was a very windy night and the waters were extremely choppy with two foot waves making it difficult to get through the water efficiently. They knew the direction they needed to go based on the winds, but they knew this search would be tricky. But then finally, by around 3 a.m., about a mile southeast of the Skyway Bridge, these student volunteers, Alice and Ryan, spotted something. Located at the shoreline under another bridge, they found a partially submerged little girl lying face up, still in that water. Alice and Ryan leaned over to pick the girl up out of the water, hoping she was still alive and that there would be some chance to save her. But unfortunately, by that point, it was too late. Phoebe had died as a result of her fall from that bridge. After bringing her body back into shore and turning her body over to the medical examiner, an autopsy was performed. It was found that she had fluid in her lungs. She had giant bruises on her back with more bruising on her jaw and lip. There were cuts and scrapes on her ear and ankle, and she had sustained a brain injury. It was determined that her cause of death was the result of drowning after being thrown off that bridge. She was alive when her father pulled her out of that car and when she fell to her death. I can't even imagine the fear and horror this little girl felt in her final moments. The horrific incident began just after midnight when police say a St. Petersburg officer on his way home spotted John Chuck speed by him on his PT cruiser up the Dick Meisner Bridge on the approach to the Sunshine Skyway. And once he reached the top, stopped his car and waited for the officer to arrive. The subject got out of his vehicle and he started saying something to the officer, but the officer had no idea what he was saying. The gentleman, the uh, suspect then went to the other side of the vehicle, pulled out a child, put the child's chest toward, put the child's face toward his chest. Then he walked to the side of the bridge and he threw the child into the water. The water was about 62 feet below. John Chuck, who police say had custody of his daughter Phoebe and lived with his parents in Tampa, got back into his car and took off while the officer stayed behind trying to save the little girl. There was a ladder on the side of the bridge, so he went down. He was trying to locate the child. Ecker College put their boat right in the water. Uh, they found the child again about an hour and a half later, about a mile away. The five-year-old was rushed to the hospital where she was pronounced dead. Her father was spotted, according to officials, minutes after the heinous crime when stop sticks were deployed, forcing John Chuck to stop. After police broke his window because he refused to get out, the 25-year-old was pulled out of the car and taken into custody. As those searches were happening, with those students finding little Phoebe's body and trying to resuscitate her, John John Chuck was being arrested for the murder of his daughter. At first, at the station, John was completely quiet and wouldn't talk to officers. He then started acting erratically and saying some bizarre things to the officer. He said he was God, then the Pope. He also asked for his Bible, which had been recovered from his car, among other items such as Phoebe's Christmas presents. 
But finally, he was able to calm down and sit down with officers to talk about what happened. He told the officer that he had been feeling different the past few weeks. He said that he got a new job and how he wanted to be baptized. Then John asked if Phoebe was okay and if she had survived the fall and the cop said that he didn't know. At that point, they were still searching for Phoebe and obviously she hadn't been sent off to the medical examiner yet, so the cop truly didn't know at this point. But during that interview, John did show a little bit of remorse but otherwise, throughout the rest of the interview, John appeared indifferent, uncaring for what he just did. I went looking for answers. I've always had problems growing up, like wondering who I was and how and what my purpose was. And ever since yesterday and a couple days before. Like what? problems how did you think you're different well um it's like i don't know like I, when i went to the church uh today, what church uh saint paul's catholic church and i spoke to father bill mm -hmm. um he told me that i wasn't gonna be ready this easter but next easter and that i was the pope um, that, uh, Francis or whatever is not, um, is not like... That he's not the real Pope? Yes. Is Phoebe okay? Phoebe? Who's that? Phoebe was my daughter. Mm -hmm. Phoebe J. John Chuck. Is she okay? I don't know, John. I haven't heard. I've been here watching and talking over you or talking with you. Of course, at this time, John was charged with the murder of his daughter. At his first court appearance, he continued acting bizarrely, telling the judge that only God can represent him in this crime. After some back and forth, though, John did ultimately agree to having representation for the trial. It was also decided that he would await his trial in jail. While in jail, he was put on suicide watch and was staying in a solitary cell. For weeks, he refused to shower, change clothes, or take his medications. He wouldn't talk to anyone, including his own lawyer and his appointed doctor. He ripped his mattress and refused to eat. He continued on with his ramblings about God and the devil, and even begged the guards to kill him. By February of 2015, John had been evaluated for his competency to stand trial, and it was decided at this time that he was not ready. He was reevaluated in September, but still, it was decided that he was not competent to stand trial. During this time, he did start treatment for his mental health issues, which included injections of antipsychotic medications. It actually wasn't until four years after Phoebe was thrown from that 62 foot bridge when a doctor finally deemed that John Johnchuk was competent to stand trial. And as you can expect, John pleaded not guilty to his charges due to reason of insanity. So, when the trial started in March of 2019, that is what the defense was arguing. His defense didn't deny that he was responsible for the death of his five-year-old daughter. They also didn't try and argue that this was an accident. There was literally a witness to the whole thing. That cop who saw him intentionally walk to the back of the car, grab his daughter, and chuck her off the railing. There is no denying what happened. However, when he committed the crime, he said that he didn't know what he was doing. He was insane. Therefore, he didn't know the difference between right and wrong, so he cannot be held accountable for his actions. At the trial, there were many witnesses who could account for John's long, long history of mental health problems that started when he was just a child. Both his mother and father abandoned him until his father ultimately came back and raised him, but not very well, according to him. From the time he was a teenager, he started using drugs, getting into fights, dropping out of high school. He was involuntarily committed to psychiatric hospitals numerous times throughout his life, where he was diagnosed with schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. 
At one point, he had been prescribed over 30 medications, but by adulthood and by the time of this crime, he was not taking his meds. After this, he was in and out of jail many, many more times. He couldn't control his rage against Michelle, his mother, or anyone else in his life. He had several DUIs for driving under the influence, and although he was never officially charged with any drug-related offenses, there are many witnesses who can speak on his heavy drug use. Then, leading to Phoebe's death, it was obvious that John was growing increasingly paranoid and delusional. He was acting erratically. Family members and friends alike all could speak to his sudden interest in reading the Bible, carrying around that giant Swedish Bible with him everywhere. Then, in the hours before Phoebe's death, he visited several churches, interacted with his lawyer, and several others, all who said he was acting insane. When being evaluated, John told a doctor that he was hearing voices. He was told that if Phoebe didn't die, everyone was going to hell. His doctors did testify to his mental insanity, saying that he truly was not mentally capable of determining right from wrong at the time of the murder. On the other hand, though, the prosecution was arguing that John knew exactly what he was doing. Yes, it's true, he was not mentally healthy, but that didn't mean he didn't know that what he was doing was wrong. He had been using Phoebe as a weapon against Michelle for years. From the time she was born, John had been abusing Michelle. Then he used the court systems to his benefit to get Michelle out of his life. When that worked, his mother entered his life again and he was jealous of all the attention she gave Phoebe. Then, once Michelle wanted to get back into Phoebe's life once the injunction expired, he freaked out. He started to get jealous of the attention his mother gave Phoebe despite being an absent mother to him. Meanwhile, he couldn't stand the thought of Michelle being involved in her life because he wanted her all to himself. This wasn't because of insanity. It was because John was a selfish narcissist who used people for his own benefit. The prosecution pointed to one specific detail in this case to make their point. The fact that when he was visiting his lawyer, he told her, this won't matter tomorrow. That meant he knew what he was going to do. He was planning her murder and knew when he was going to carry it out, but he also knew enough about right and wrong to know that he can't say exactly what he was planning on doing. The prosecution had their own psychiatrist testify who said that she believed John to be malingering his symptoms, meaning that he was exaggerating and faking certain parts of his mental illnesses to be deemed incompetent. At the end of the day, I agree with most of these arguments, and I do think that both sides have a bit of truth to them. I think he suffered greatly from his mental illness. No one who is mentally healthy can treat people the way John did. No one who is mentally healthy can throw their daughter off of a bridge. We can see that John was acting increasingly erratic in the days leading to the murder. He was undergoing more and more stress as the days went on. That is true. So that could mean one of two things. Either this stress exacerbated his mental illness, or he grew more and more worried that Phoebe was going to be taken away from him. So he decided to punish everyone around him by getting rid of her. Personally, I think he was trying to punish both his mother and Michelle. I think he was jealous that his mom was giving her so much attention despite being an absent mother. I think he was mad that Michelle was trying to get her back into her life. So, being the selfish, narcissistic monster he is, he decided that he was going to get rid of the problem all together. After hearing all of the evidence on both sides, which is pretty much everything I've discussed up to this point, both sides made their closing arguments. After this, the jury was sent off for their deliberations, and when they came back, they decided that they did not believe John's insanity claim, and they found him guilty for the murder of his precious five-year-old daughter, Phoebe. For this, he was given a sentence of life behind bars without the possibility of parole. The matter of State of Florida versus John John Chuck, case number 1500226CF, murder in the first degree. We the jury find as follows as the defendant in this case. The defendant is guilty of murder in the first degree as charged. So say we all sign the date of four person of the jury. Um, Mr. John Chuck, it's an automatic life sentence. I'm sure you know that on your conviction, so I will adjudicate you guilty of murder in the first degree. I will sentence you to life in prison. Yes, Your Honor.
In the aftermath of this, those around Phoebe all wondered how they could have prevented this horrific crime. There were so many people in her life who could have done more. So many people who saw his increasingly erratic behaviors who could have stepped in. His mother feels guilty about doting over Phoebe so much when she was an absent mother to John. The lawyer who met with John just hours before her death wishes she could have kept Phoebe in her office and called officers. Michelle wishes that she would have reported John every single time he hurt her and that she would have fought harder to stay in Phoebe's life after she was taken from her. So many people in her life wish they could have and would have done more with the hindsight of what they know now. You saw the smile on her face and she had a smile that would light up a room. She loved arts and crafts. She loved this baby doll. And I, as her mama, loved her more than anything in the entire world. I gave her everything I could and all the love that I could ever give. Her little moves, her little dance, um, her animation. She was so animated. I collapsed into the officer's arms and I'm like, all I could think of is he loved her so much. Why would he? Why? However, while none of these people could have predicted that this would have happened, there are some people who truly could have and should have done more. The amount of times DCFS stepped in and knew about John's behaviors yet kept Phoebe with him is atrocious. The fact that he was granted a domestic violence injunction despite his own history of abuse and the courts knowing about that history of abuse is appalling. It was so clear that he was gaming the system, yet he was just allowed to continue doing so. Once again, we see DCFS dropping the ball and a child paying for it with their life. In this case, DCFS did admit their mishandling of the case, but they basically said that many of the times they got reports regarding Phoebe, they just assumed that they were custody disputes and nothing more. So that's why they didn't step in more or take it seriously. To me, it just seems like such a sick excuse for actively choosing not to help a little girl in need. At the end of the day, John fully got what he deserved. You all know what I think happened. I think he knew perfectly well what he was doing. I think it was purposeful and he knew it was wrong. This never should have happened to Phoebe. She deserved so much more from life than what she got. And overall, this case is just so, so very tragic and heartbreaking, as I say in so many of these cases. But that is all the information I have for you all today. And now I want to hear what you all think. Why do you think DCFS didn't step in more? Do you think his family members could have done more to prevent this? Do you think John was truly insane at the time of the crime? Or did he know exactly what he was doing? If so, why did he do this? Let's discuss this and any other thoughts you have in the comments below. If you like this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to turn the notification bell to on so you don't miss out on any of my future videos. Make sure you follow my Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts. All will be linked down below. And if you have any case suggestions, please make sure to fill up the Google form, which is also listed down below. With that, I hope you guys have an amazing week, stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time.